Sports Talk New York with your hosts, Mark Rosenman and A.J. Carter. Sports Talk New York is sponsored in part by Prince Associates, Cardboard Memories, The Phoenix Tube Company, Matt Giuliano's Play Like a Pro Baseball, the law firm of Decalator, Cohen and DeBrisco, Solomon Jewelers, and Relish Restaurant of Kings Park. Here are your hosts, Mark and AJ. First live guest on WLIE 540 AM Sports Talk Edition has played portions of 13 seasons with the Detroit Tigers, Texas Rangers, Colorado Rockies, and yes, the Boston Red Sox, the reason why I'm wearing the jersey tonight, Milwaukee Brewers and the Tampa Bay Rays. He was a 57th round draft pick by the Detroit Tigers in 1995. In 1998 with the AA Jacksonville Suns, he won the Southern League MVP award as he batted 322 with a league high 28 home runs, 47 doubles, 146 RBIs, most ever in the Southern League. His league record for RBIs broke the 1986 record set of by Terry Stein back right. of 132. He also set league records with 81 extra base hits, 319 total bases, and broke the old doubles record of 44 with 47. He also led the league in hits, 176, which is the eighth most in the minors, runs 113th, which is sixth most in the minors, and finished sixth in batting. He was honored by his minor league player of the year by USA Today, Baseball Weekly, and the Sporting News, and USA Today. He was named Tigers minor league player of the year and Detroit's number one prospect by Baseball America. He was a member of the 2004 World Champion Red Sox and was one of nine players on the field for the final out when they broke the 86-year curse of the Bambino. It's our pleasure to welcome Gabe Kapler to WLIE Sports Talk New York. Welcome, Gabe. Thank you very much. Good to be here. You know, you take a look at it, and you're a graduate of, of William Howard Taft High School. It, it's a public school le, uh, located on Ventura Boulevard, a school that has produced some pretty good baseball players. Larry Durka, Rick Orbach, Kevin Kennedy, Hollywood Square's Peter Marshall's son, Pete LeCock, and Robin Yount. The school's also <laughs> produced uh, some notable actors and actresses as well. Jason Bateman, Lucy Kudrow are a couple ones that come to mind. Uh, what was it like to go to high school at Taft for you, and what makes that baseball program so good? Uh, you forgot probably the most famous uh, alum of Taft High. I would say it would be Ice Cube. <laughs> no, I didn't forget. Okay. I just left him out. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a hotbed for, for baseball talent, to be, to be sure. And that includes the whole San Fernando Valley. San Fernando Valley, my year, produced Jeff Supon. It also produced Randy Wolf. A um, guy by the name of Stacy Kleiner, who was just a tremendous baseball player at the time. And uh, year after year, the San Fernando Valley in Southern California produces top notch baseball players. So it's an honor to be a part of that. And, you know, the, the Hollywood thing, I think there's a little more made of it than, uh, you know, Taft is, is actually kind of a tough city school. And it just so happens that it produced some, some pretty, pretty high level, high Hollywood talent. Now, we mentioned in the Open, you drafted in the June Amateur Draft in 95 at the age of 19. You start playing that year for Jamestown in New York Penn League, a league that AJ and I and people in this area are now familiar with because of the Brooklyn Cyclones. But going back to being a 19-year-old kid with some college experience under your belt, describe what that first taste of, of pro baseball was for you. And if you could, if you could put it in context as to what it must be like for a 19-year-old Bryce Harper making the jump to the majors at the same age. Yeah, 19 year old. Uh, when I look back on that time, I was just a baby. Um, in fact, I don't even feel like I became uh, a grown up until I was probably in my mid 20s. And I really didn't know what I was doing. I was just trying to be as big, strong, and as athletic as possible. So uh, for Bryce to be as mature he, as he is as a baseball player and as a human being is, is fairly impressive. Uh, the New York Penn League was quite a surprise for me, and I'll tell you why. When they, when they drafted me from Southern California and they told me I was going to go play in New York, uh, I didn't really have context of what New York meant. All I thought it meant, I thought I was going to go play in Manhattan. I didn't know what it, what it meant to be in Jamestown. So the, the, the shock, the culture shock of landing in Jamestown, New York, uh, in itself was strenuous enough, uh, not to mention the high-level baseball talent that I encountered. Uh, I, I kind of figured that I'd be playing against much better baseball players, but those were Division I um, superstars that were in that league, and I was coming from a small junior college in Southern California. So the New York Penn League was, was a challenge, as was the transition to a small town in New York, uh, which, I, which I had no idea existed. Had the snow melted by the time you got there? <laughs> there was no snow on the ground. Uh, there, there was certainly a whole different level of, of like fast food restaurant, um, you know, hotel chains. It was just very, very different from Southern California. Yeah, it's also interesting because I, I bring up Harper because it seems more and more players are making the jump from either college or just after getting a small little taste in the minors. And, and it's not what AJ and I are accustomed to seeing. And you 
followed more what we know, you know, we're both in our 50s, the yearly progression from low A to double A to the majors. We mentioned Jamestown, but you also had stops in Fayetteville, Lakeland, Jacksonville, Toledo, playing under managers such as Bruce Fields, Dwight Lowry, Mark Melsky, Dave Anderson, and other than Dave Anderson and maybe even Dwight Lowry, those are names that most baseball fans never heard of, but they're good baseball men who teach fundamentals at the minor league levels. Do you think that some of the basic fundamentals of baseball are being eroded by the lack of minor league experience some of these players are getting? I see. I, I tend to disagree with you. I don't think that there are players that are getting less minor league baseball experience. I think we're just, uh, as a society, illuminating the ones that make the jump. So I think still the majority of players go through each minor league level if they get to the big leagues. I mean, the more, majority of them get weeded out, um, you know, before AAA. But certainly, I think guys like Bryce Harper and Mike Trout are few and far between, and the majority of guys actually do hit the minor leagues and stay in the minor leagues a long time. In fact, you know, we're seeing also guys that, that are reaching the big leagues at 26, 27, and 28. Um, you know, I got to the big leagues when I was 22, but, but certainly guys are spending a lot of time in the, in the minor league. It just, it just so happened when we turn on Sports Center, it's Bryce Harper, it's, it's, it's Mike Trout, and, and guys that are just high profile. So uh, we think that everybody's doing the same thing, or, or many players are doing the same thing. Well, I think a lot of what you see more now, too, is unlike. What you did, Gabe, is players stay three years in college, and college provides, so they, they get into the minor leagues at a later age, a later stage now, which is why I think you're seeing the 26- and the 27-year-old rookies. You know, college has a greater meaning, higher class of ball. It used to be, you know, you had to sign 18 years old, and if you make the majors by the time you're 21, you know, you were done. Yeah, you know, I, I think you're right. I think there are a lot of guys also who are senior signs, and um, we saw I saw a lot of that coming up. There was a lot of guys that were, were four year players in college, and they mixed in were the high school guys that had spent a couple of years in rookie ball, and then let's say made the leap to the New York Penn League um, or some of the other short season A ball leagues, and then ultimately to a long season A ball league. So, uh, yeah, I think I think it's still a good variety. And when I was a minor league player, it, the variety was there as well. I mean, you had. Uh, you know, guys from on my first Jamestown team, guys from the Dominican Republic, guys from Michigan University, guys from Harvard, um, guys from small junior colleges, and guys, guys from high school. So uh, there was a lot of variety then. And then in my experience managing uh, in A-ball, the experience was the same, you know, 10, 15 years later. So of all your managers and stops in the minors, who and where do you feel you learn the most from? Um, wow, that's a, that's a really tough question. I learned a whole lot from Dave Anderson. Really what I learned how, from Dave Anderson at Double A Jacksonville was how to be relaxed. I also had an, uh, an A-ball first base coach and Double A first base coach by the name of Matt Martin, who's tremendously gifted um, in both identifying talent and uh, teaching the fundamentals of infield play, as well as just a skilled, infield, or, uh, skilled hitting coach. Uh, now he is a low-level manager with the Los Angeles Dodgers, and at uh, a few years back, he was also the roving infield instructor for the Dodgers. But guys like that, grinders, uh, really powerful men in baseball because they develop, they develop high-level talent on a regular basis. Now we fast forward to Sunday, September 20th, 1998, Tiger Stadium against the Minnesota Twins, and manager Larry Parrish has you penciled into the starting lineup, batting six and playing right field against Benjamin Sampson. What are some of the things you remember about that day and your first at bat in the bigs? Uh, the first thing that I remember is walking into the old Tiger Stadium clubhouse um, and seeing my my jersey hanging in the locker with the old English D and just understanding who who had worn that old English D before me, Hank Greenberg, Ty Cobb, um, just to name a few. And the fact that I was going to be playing in that, you know, storied ballpark. In fact, you know, fast forward to 1999 and the last, last game at Tiger Stadium, uh, you know, that was a very powerful moment for both me and my teammates. Uh, the, you know, the Tigers at that time, the Bobby Higginsons, the Tony Clarks, the Damian Easleys of the world, that got to really shut that stadium down. Uh, that first moment in, in the big leagues was, was special. I, I had to pinch myself. But, you know, more importantly, I wish I could go back and do it over so that I could experience every breath um, and not be so stressed out about just trying to get a hit, <laughs> which is really what I remember the most is, you know, just finding my way to first base. It's funny that you say that because the next question is, the next season you actually earned the starting center fielder's job at the age of 23. You get your first career home run on April 30th against the Tampa Bay Rays and wind up hitting a career-high 18 home runs in just over 400 at-bats, which amazingly was third among AL rookies behind Carlos Beltran and Brian Daubach. We see it here now with Lucas Duda of the Mets getting the bulk of starts in right field. How important is it for a young player to know that the job, you know, once he's won, is pretty much his day in and day out? You 
basically had Polonia and Barte and even Brian Hunter starting when you weren't, but for all intents and purposes, you were the everyday center fielder. Does that allow you, you mentioned that relax, does that allow you to relax a little bit and try not to do too much to impress the manager to stay in the lineup? It does allow you to relax if you believe it as a player. Unfortunately, I didn't believe it. I thought that somebody was coming to take my job every single day, um, and I played like it. I mean, I think I played a, a little bit tense that first year. In fact, and it was actually a pretty good rookie season. Like you said, I hit 18 home runs, um, play, played a pretty good center field, but I really came home thinking that I wasn't very good. And I think the reason for that was the high level of success I had had the, the prior two years in the minor leagues, and I expected it to be more of the same. And so if you're coming off the season that I had in A Jackson, and the year prior in, in High A Lakeland, um, and, and you were me, I was like, okay, I'm expecting to continue the success. Unfortunately, the pitching gets a whole lot better. The defense is probably the number one factor, um, gets a whole lot better. In other words, the shortstop's gobbling up the ball in the hole, the second baseman's going up the middle to take away that base hit, and, and that can be quite frustrating, um, whereas that was a hit in the minor leagues that no longer is. So I came home that off season after actually having a decent rookie season and thinking I stunk. And uh, so... You know, coming back full circle, the, for the players that believe that they're going to have the, the ball every single day and be out in the field every single day, uh, it's a very comforting feeling. I, I never quite believed that. Perhaps it came from the fact that I was drafted in the 57th round and felt like I had to work for, for every morsel. So um, I think that's just the way I was wired, the way I was made up. And I think certainly players around the league are, are, are made up different than, than I was. As you get to the major leagues and you go through and you break in, you're not doing quite as well as you did in you know, double-A at high A, what goes through your mind? What do you have to learn in terms of making adjustments? Is it learning to hit the curveball? Is it learning that pitchers are going to change it the second time around they pitched you? What's the biggest adjustment you, you had to learn? Um, you know, I, I think it is an adjustment. There's mechanical adjustments that take place. There's timing adjustments that take place. Uh, there's spotlight adjustments that take place. Um, and then there's fatigue adjustments that take place. For instance, you know, in the minor leagues, you play 142 games. Now, uh, the difference between 142 and 162 is significant. If you add on the postseason and, and spring, training, spring training games that you play, uh, let's say in a season like 2004 when you go all the way to the end, you're talking about 200 games that you're playing. So um, there's a f fatigue, a wear and tear that goes through your body on top of the stress and, you know, the spotlight. You're playing in a city like Detroit or Boston, um, you know, you're, you're, that spotlight is a whole lot brighter and, and hotter than, let's say, in a place like Tampa um, or, or even Milwaukee. So, you know, the, the adjustments are all over the board. They're constant. And if you're not making them, you're getting weeded out quickly. Uh, you mentioned the fact that you know when you went home during that off season, you, you didn't think you did as well as you did during that off season. After that breakout year, you're traded. Um, what was your initial reaction? Because from what you said, and then getting that jolt, because you did, for all intents and purposes, have a very good rookie season. You know, what was your initial reaction to that trade? I was I was surprised. So, uh, you know, I think what an organization does to a young good player in you know that they consider to be a prospect or a priority or a high level player they tend to pump into you that you know you're going to wear that tiger d forever um, and it's just not simply not the case I mean, at the end of the day it's a business so before i figured out it was a business i figured I'd, I'd play in a tiger uniform my entire career um and then probably retire a tiger pretty naive but like i said as a 19 year old kid i was um i was really a kid and you know, even as a 22-year-old, I was I was really a kid. So to get traded in that off season, it was it was pretty exciting because it meant that another another club wanted you. At the same time, you're like, oh, I guess I'm not going to play uh, be a Tiger forever. I guess I'm not going to wear the, the same uniform. I'm not going to be Cal Ripken Jr. or, or Tony Gwynn. I'm probably going to be more like 95% of the league that plays on more than one team. Um, and then once you come to that realization, you say, okay, it's a business. I'll treat it like a business. Um, I'll be the best teammate that I can be. And, and every day I'll go out on. Onto the, onto the field and, and try to kick some butt. And so you, you learn to focus on those types of things and, and keep everything else on the periphery. And, and you take a look at your career, and, and there's a pattern that emerges, that no matter where you go, you have success, and then you're moved along. But then when you go to the new place, you have success again. Is it, you know, we always hear sometimes change of scenery, but it wasn't like you were tremendously slumping. You, you were having good stints in all these different places. Did you use the trade as motivation? For instance, you know, opening day in Texas, you hit two home runs on opening day. Did you use that as incentive? Did that drive you? Or was it just, you know, 
something that <laughs> we're reading too much into? I don't know. I think I think you have to be a a good self evaluator. So while I had a couple of good years, I was just kind of, um, you know, I wasn't good enough to like ensure that nobody was going to come and take my job. I was, you know, I played to the best of my ability. I think I got a, a lot out of my ability, but I, I think I was just a, a pretty good baseball player and not the kind of baseball player that warrants you know, wearing the same uniform. There's not many guys that, that do, quite frankly. I mean, there's, there's really like the, the top, 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 you know, maybe 5 or 10% who end up staying in, in the same place for a very long time or getting to choose where they play as, as free agents. So, uh, you know, I'm a pretty good self-evaluator. I know I was a good, not a great baseball player. Um, and if I had been a great baseball player, I probably would have had, had more control about where I played. But, you know, I struggled in Texas when I got traded to Colorado. Um, you know, when I got, when I signed a free agent contract uh, with the Red Sox. There was only two clubs that wanted me. It was the Red Sox and the Cardinals, and I had to make a decision between the two. Uh, you know, when I went to go play in Japan, it was because I wanted to play every day, and I didn't have a job to play every day in the major leagues. I had a job, you know, to be a good, solid, complimentary piece as a fourth outfielder with the Red Sox, but I wanted, I wanted the opportunity to play every day. So I figured, okay, let me go where I can play every day, and then I'll come back and earn an everyday job in the big leagues. It's, you just go where you go. You go where you can get work, and you do the, you do the best job that you can possibly do when you get it. We know that your time's limited, so we're going to just ask you a few more questions. We'll let you go. You mentioned, you know, when your contract was purchased by the Red Sox from the Rockies. Uh, for me, that's maybe where your career becomes defined as you're part of the 2004 Red Sox. That season, you play a career high 136 games, hitting six home runs, driving in 33 runs and 290 at bats, uh, 272 batting average, but 303 in games that were late and close. You also led the team with six outfield assists, and you're one of nine players on the field for the last out of the 2004 World Series when the curse of the Bambino was broken. What was that like for you to be on such a special team in the history of the game? It, it's, still, it's still the same. I, mean, I don't think a, a, a day goes by that I don't think about that, that I don't realize how lucky I am to be a part of that. Uh, the teammates from that team are ones that I cherish and think about you know, every day, the times that we had on and off the field, uh, the bonds that, that can never be broken. And just the fact that I, you know, I, I really feel like I was in the right place at the right time with the right group. Because you know, to, I, what I realize is that to win a World Series championship, everything has to go right. Uh, I remember Kurt Schilling telling me, Cap, it's not, just a t it's not just having 25 players that contribute. It's having 35 players that contribute. You need every guy that comes up and down from the minor leagues to contribute. You need every coach to contribute. And everything has to fall into place to win a World Series ring. And so just being a part of that, um, just learning from guys like, like Kurt Schilling um, and playing with guys like Nomar Garcia Parra and teammates like you know, uh, Kevin Millar, Jason Veritek, Trot Nixon, guys that, that I'll call my friends till the day I die, um, pretty, pretty special and, and something that I, that I feel pretty proud of. And you take that history behind you and you move on a couple other places, but then you end up on the Tampa Bay Rays. And Andrew Friedman, the Rays executive of baseball operations, said this about you when, when they got you. Because he's also a plus defensive outfielder, he's become a tremendous asset here. His value even extends beyond the field. His knowledge and presence make him a positive influence on our younger players. You look at what the Rays accomplished while you were there and how that young core continues to play well. Put that into context with what Andrew Friedman said about you, and how does that make you feel personally? Well, first of all, it's flattering because Andrew is, is one of the sharpest GMs in the game, if not the sharpest GM in the game. Um, he's one of those guys that has to find ways um, – you know, to think outside the box and put a team on the field uh, with, a, with a much lower payroll in a division that's an absolute monster. So, um, you know, year after year, the Red Sox and the Yankees are going to dominate from a payroll perspective. So for a team like the Rays, who really doesn't even have the money to spend that, let's say, a Baltimore um, or a Toronto have, it's, it's pretty impressive what, what Andrew and his staff have accomplished. Now, it's not just Andrew, it's the scouts. Um, it's also, you know, all of the front office. It's, it's an incredible manager and in Joe Madden, uh, an incredible coaching staff that includes Davey Martinez and, and um, just, just good players across the board. He seemed, you know, Andrew seems to find a guy every single year to shine in the bullpen that nobody expected to shine. Um, see Fernando Rodney this year, Rafael Soriano a few years back. Um, so to be thought of in high regard, from a guy like Andrew is, is super flattering, and, and I'm lucky enough to call Andrew a friend at this point. 
Now, one interesting aspect uh, of your career, and and for AJ and I, uh, might be a little more interesting than uh, other people out there. It's your strong ties to your Jewish heritage. Uh, AJ and I had the pleasure of seeing you at the opening of the Maccabi Games in the Fleet Center years ago. 2004, I guess it was. I think it yeah. was, yeah. You yeah. have a Star of David tattooed on your left calf with the inscription, strong-willed, strong-minded in Hebrew, and the post-Holocaust motto, never again with a flame, and the dates of the Holocaust on your right calf. You also signed a one-year contract with the Tampa Bay Rays for $1 million and $18, the extra $18 representing both your lucky number and Chai, which is a symbol for life in Judaism. Why is your heritage so important to you? It's just a, uh, an important reminder of where I come from, who I am, and, and some of the things that I'm proud of. Um, you know, Judaism to most people is a religion. Uh, Judaism to me is much more about who I am, where I come from, and, and the human being that I'm proud to be. So, um, you know, culturally, um, the history of the Jewish people is important to me, and identifying with, with being ultimately proud of who I am and where I come from is, is front and center and why I got the tattoos and why I've always um, kind of spoke out about being proud of being who I, of who I am and where I come from. So that being said, obviously, Israel is trying to qualify to be in the, the World Baseball Classic. Are you looking to play on that team? I am. Uh, it's very nice. likely that I'll play on that team and coach as well. Um, Brad Osmus will manage the ball club. Sean Green will participate as a player and likely as a coach. And we have some really high-level uh, minor league players that are going to get to play in the in the World Baseball Classic qualifying round in September. And then ultimately I expect us to, to qualify and go on and compete in the WBC. Um, but first and foremost, we have to, to go to the qualifier, uh, kick some butt, and find our way to the WC, WBC. And no truth to your uh, rumor that Sandy Koufax will be the starting pitcher. <laughs> Uh, no truth to that rumor as far as I know, but, I mean, I, I wouldn't bet against that guy. All right. Now, lastly, um, w the feature that we're going to write after this is a sports simulation, um, basically. And we want we match up historical teams. Right now, tonight, we have the 91 Yankees versus the 98 Yankees. If you were to pick two teams in the history of baseball that you'd want to see match up against each other, who would they be? Oh, man, that's tough. I, I, maybe, the, maybe the 98 Yanks versus the 04 Sox. Nice. That's, that's, okay. where, that's, where, that's probably where I'd go with it. Right. Um, but, you know, it's not always a team that wins the World Series that's the best team on the field. So I, I, if I went back and had some time to analyze, I'd probably pick a team that, that may not have won the World Series pretty deep. Okay, excellent, Gabe. We appreciate your time tonight. And uh, it was a thrill for you to be our first guest yes. here on WLIE Sports Talk New York. So thanks so much, Gabe. We appreciate it, Gabe. Thanks, fellas. Take okay. care. You have a good night. Gabe Kapler, member of the 2004 championship Boston Red Sox.